A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The following message came to Jeremiah from the Lord. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write the words I've spoken to you in a book. For thus says the Lord, incurable is your wound, grievous your bruise. There is none to plead your cause, no remedy for your running sore, no healing for you. All your lovers have forgotten you. They do not seek you. I struck you as an enemy would strike, punished you cruelly. Why cry out over your wound? Your pain is without relief. Because of your great guilt, your numerous sins, I have done this to you. Thus says the Lord, see, I will restore the tents of Jacob, his dwellings I will pity. City shall be rebuilt upon hill, and palace restored as it was. For them will resound songs of praise, the laughter of happy men. I will make them not few, but many. They will not be tiny, for I will glorify them. His son shall be as of old. His assembly before me shall stand firm. I will punish all his oppressors. His leader shall be one of his own and his rulers shall come from his kin. When I summon him, he shall shall approach me. How else should one take the deadly risk of approaching me, says the Lord? You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Verbum Domini. The Lord will build up Zion again and appear in all his glory. The nations shall revere your name, O Lord, and all the kings of the earth your glory. When the Lord has rebuilt Zion and appeared in his glory, when he has regarded the prayer of the destitute and not despised their prayer. Build up Zion again and appear in all his glory. Let this be written for generation to come, and let his future creatures praise the Lord. The Lord looked down from his holy height. From heaven he beheld the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoners, to release those doomed to die. The Lord will build up time again and appear in all his glory. The children of your servants shall abide and their posterity shall continue in your presence, that the name of the Lord may be declared on Zion and his praise in Jerusalem, when the peoples gather together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. Sancti Evangelii Secundum Mateum. Gloria Jesus made the disciples get into a boat 
and precede him to the other side of the sea, while he dismissed the crowds. After doing so, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat, already a few miles offshore, was being tossed about by the waves, for the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, he came toward them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. At once Jesus spoke to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? After they got into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. After making the crossing, they came to the land of Gennesaret. When the people of that place recognized him, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought to him all those who were sick and begged him that they might touch only the tassel of his cloak. And as many as touched it were healed. Verbum Domini. In the Gospel of Matthew, this isn't the first time that Jesus led his apostles into the storm. Some months before Jesus was with him, he was sleeping on the helm of the boat. And as the violent storm was swamping the boat, they had to wake him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And Jesus then too is able to respond, why are you terrified? you of little faith, and he rebukes the wind, and there is a great calm. They say at that time, what sort of man is this, that even the winds and sea obey him? Now Jesus is putting them to a different sort of test. He sends them ahead on the sea. He sends the crowds away. He goes up on the mountain to pray to his Father. He lives always for the Father. So instead of being physically present with his disciples, he wonders, will they be able to trust in him even when he is far away, when they no longer see Christ, when he will ascend to the Father? Will they be able to live totally for Christ, put all the, their eggs in, in that basket of, of Christ. And so the gospel is able to contrast the peace of Christ, Christ who lives always for the Father, in the distress of the apostles at sea, the ones who forget or are still coming to learn who Jesus Christ really is. Who is this man? And so a strange thing happens that Jesus is walking across the sea, and it doesn't say how they see him, but perhaps there was some type of light that during the night they were able to, to recognize Christ. And at this time, even though they've been in the storm for eight, ten hours, according to scripture scholars, their terror is the greatest when they see Jesus Christ. And they wonder, who, who is this? They say, it's, it's a ghost. And so Christ is actually at this time almost like a, 
a cause of fear in the disciples. And what Jesus is doing is in inviting them to trust in him, to come to a, a deeper relationship of faith in him. Jesus will be victorious over that fear in ourselves that we experience when we come before him, when we come before the holiness of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus tramples down the waves of the sea. He does what only God can do. He walks on the mighty waters. And so with this, uh, what's happening is the, the apostles, perhaps we too would say, Jesus really waited until it's too late. Why does he send the disciples into the storm? He knows what's going to happen to them. And he waits until it seems like they're going to die on the water. It, they've been exhausted, and they've exhausted every other possibility. They're, four of them are fishermen, and they're always getting into trouble on the water. You know, the waters, especially in the ancient world, the waters had a very um, menacing, almost personified evil type, um, type of connotation, that the waters were a place where where evil and destruction happened. And you, you can understand this just because of, of the dangers of going on the water. But, so this episode really is, is about growth and faith in the apostles, that they would have a more deeply rooted trust in Jesus Christ. And it, for us too, with the eight to 10 hours, with going into the storm, experiencing the full brunt of, of temptation, of struggle, sometimes we have to come for us in the spiritual life. It takes time for us to come to that point where we can abandon ourselves totally to God, where we've given up on all the things that we can do. Our resources are spent until Christ will really come to us. He waits for that moment to waits for that moment where we're really willing to utterly abandon ourselves to God. This happened in, in our time, in the last century, to Walter Chizek. He was a, a Jesuit priest who really wanted to work in Russia. And this was right before, well, actually during the Second World War. And he was eventually taken into custody and they had terrible prison situations in the Soviet Union. He was in a prison cell with 300 other people for four years with no running water. And after a few years, he started to tell people he was a priest. And so he was taken into solitary as a, a Vatican spy. He spent a whole year in solitary confinement on a starvation diet, no nothing to do, but they would constantly interrogate them. And Walter was, was a man of extremely strong will. And it took the whole year until he was able to basically have a breakdown and, and, put, and realize that his whole life, he'd really been trusting in himself and not in God. And he had to see in all these things that were happening, God's providence at work that everything was in the hands of God. He could trust himself to God. And so the example in the scriptures of that, I'm getting ahead of myself, is Peter, the one whose faith is still coming to birth. So before, when Peter was called, he told our Lord to go away. He said, I am a sinful man, but now he knows that there's nowhere else to go that Jesus has the words of everlasting life. He's, he wants to be where Jesus Christ is, even if that means going into the storm, going into the place where there is suffering, that he will go and be with Christ. He steps out in faith. He's willing to respond to Christ, to the grace of Christ. And by his power, by the power of God, he too is able to walk on the water. And this shouldn't surprise us. The disciples are giving many powers by Christ, powers to heal, 
to forgive sins, to cast out demons. Um, St. Paul raises the dead man that he put to sleep um, by his homily that's going long. And so everything comes from Christ. The power of the disciples comes from Christ. And as long as they keep their eyes on him, that their fear won't return, that they realize their strength is in another, in Christ. Faith is a radical holding on to Christ. But Peter returns to fear. The rock begins to sink. And so Christ is near at hand at that moment. He only has to reach out. And together with Christ, Peter returns to the boat. He returns to his friends, to the disciples, with Jesus. After this experience of struggle, he has a greater sense of who Jesus Christ is. And he brings that to the disciples. They walk together to the boat. And once they are together again, there is peace. That the presence of Christ is a source of peace in the church. And so, in the end, the, the message is really that we should not let the storms of life keep us from seeking always to be with Jesus Christ. Wherever he can be found, we're willing to go. And even though, even at times in our struggle, he might seem to be absent, we know that's not true, that he's not untouched by our distress. He knows what we're going through. He's praying for us always before the Father. And he, we, with experience, we realize he waits for the right moment to come to us, to grasp us by the hand, to increase our faith. And so in love and faith, we should also be willing to go out and meet him, to trust him. Trust is the risk that love must take, that we're willing to go out into the storm, to find Jesus Christ, to be with Jesus Christ, wherever he may be found.